better, even better than we thought. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction. It's, and thank you so much to the Institute for putting together not just this event, but this series of events that connect us as communities around the concepts of the scientific world. I'm a writer. My education is in journalism. My fellow writers and I see our jobs as storytellers first. But we count on the scientific community to arm us with the background and detail to bolster those stories. Just as the scientific community, I believe, looks to the writing community to help share the findings, interpret the quantitative into something that involves feelings and emotions, and to answer the question of, what does that mean to me? I heard a broadcast on CBC Radio's ideas the other day that turned the tables again, looking to evolutionary psychologists to sort out the origins of human storytelling. And some say that our ability to tell stories is what separates us from other beasts. In other words, we are homo fictus. To me, that's what this whole series is about. So I'm going to start with a story, which is the first story that you'll find in this book. It is the story of Francesco's fig. Francesco's fig is on life support. Woo! This is on wheels. <laughs> it squats behind a pale stucco house on the corner lot in Toronto, St. Clair West. It owns the space. No room to swing a bat or toss a ball here. The tree tucks in tight to a brick garage, a stubby trunk shooting out sturdy branches that fill it above the roof. Decades ago, this Toronto neighborhood drew European immigrants moving beyond their countrymen's first stop in the city's original Little Italy, a few kilometers to the south. It had slightly larger houses with room for a bigger garden, a step closer to selling in, away from the identity of the company. When I visit on a July morning, the tree looks lush with light, onion-shaped orbs of fruit showing the first blushes of aubergine on the damp tree. The most natural of conditions, a fruit tree bearing fruit, has taken a lot of human intervention. Every fall for the past 20 years, before the frost sets in, Francesco and the men of his neighborhood sweated together to bind the tree upward. They lassoed the giant, pulling ropes toward the trunk until it stood rigid. They covered it in layers of plastic and tarps and more ropes. It took an afternoon of struggle, followed by homemade crowd up, shared after a good job done, glasses held in the house cans. <coughs> fig trees need heat. You don't see these fig trees in our markets. These come straight off the tree. Canada doesn't have much heat, as you know. So men like Francesco, immigrants, determined to make the new world their own, improvise. Some dig trenches as long as their trees are high, and also with the help of friends, grab hold of the trunk and rock the tree back and forth, patiently watching until the root ball is loose enough to tip the whole thing over into this trench. They bury it in this temporary grave. So where it sits for the winter. Francesco was such a successful gardener that his tree grew too tall for his yard. He couldn't build the trench long enough. So he improvised again. <coughs> Deep inside the shrouds, he set four cinder blocks around the tree, building a tiny room for the tree's base. He dropped a line of plastic piping into the center to be left to let the moisture out. Then to ensure the tree would survive another winter, he installed a thermostat and a space heater. He loves that tree. The fig tree is known in the neighborhood as the mother. Francesco had been generous in sharing not only the bounty of the honey fruit, but cuttings from the tree. Her offspring are in yards and suburbs, many blocks from her home, off the back slope of Francesco's house. Last winter, Francesco died. His family packed up his belongings, his shovels and rakes and pruning shears, prepared the house for sale, doing their best to showcase the curb appeal by removing the rows and rows of plumber's pipe that held up grapevines and beans. His son didn't have the heart to turn off the heat on the fig tree, so she lived on to see another day. One more spring, just one more spring, they hoped. The new owner is buying home in January, 
couple of young children who hadn't considered the burden of the legacy, and now we're faced with the decision to provide perpetual care or pull the club. What would you do? So that is the crux of the fruitful city. We have these beautiful agricultural graffiti marks that show us where people once lived, what they planted, what they ate, and we have to decide what to do with those graffiti marks, those signs of life that are now growing among us, but no longer cared for by their original owners. Most of the fruit we add to a lunch bag in this country isn't indigenous to Canada. The basket of apples you saw in the front as you came in, not Canadian. Not at all. Well, I shouldn't say not Canadian, because we're Canadian now, but not indigenous to this country. Sweet apples, pears, most plums, peaches, we're all carried here by newcomers. Indigenous peoples use many of the berries native to this part of the world to soften meats and flavor fish, and they use pine needles, needles to treat scurvy. We can find a lot of those indigenous fruits still here, but most of us walk on by. Hackberries, anyone produced a hackberry or eat one lately? Okay, good for you. Uh, service berries, they're delicious, but a lot of us walk right past them. Uh, buffalo berries, I'm going to guess no one's using that. Juniper berries, all used as uh, an important part of indigenous diets. We tend not to use them anymore. The stuff after, the stuff that we put in our lunch bags, are carried here. The first newcomers brought apples and cider. Again, try the word off skirt. It's believed the first apple orchard was planted in what's known today as an apple royal in 1610. From his diaries, we know that Samuel de Champlain planted apples around the same time in Quebec. So we saw a lot of those kinds of fruits being planted. When the European women arrived, things changed. It said that some refused to stop in Quebec because the climate wouldn't allow for peach trees. So they wanted their peaches. Instead, they followed the path of Etienne Brule of the St. Lawrence and on to what's become the Niagara Fruit Belt passing their way south of here. But well, we haven't stopped since. Every one of us who comes here, every newcomer who comes, comes with a taste of home. We crave what we have wherever we're from, and we're going to do whatever we can to get them. So we sneak in slips of our favorite fruit trees, hidden in suitcases, up a jacket sleeve, wherever we could to make this sometimes unforgiving land our home. I have a brother-in-law who's from Portugal. When he was 12 years old, he arrived with passion fruit stuffed in his socks. As an adult, he can't really tell us why, except for that he knew he really liked them and he wanted to have them. And somewhere he must have known he was not going to have that in Canada, his new home. Uh, I have, well, Francesco brought his fig from Italy, but we also know that he grafted on slips from Portugal and Greece, our friends of his, have done the same. So that fig tree he was protecting so carefully was really from all over. It's a bit of a microcosm of what this city is, what this region is, and what this country is. I know of another man who grew up in Trinidad who had a banana tree on his back, back door. The banana tree is not going to grow here outside in this climate. So he planted one in a pot, and every summer he rolls it out to his back door so it feels like home. Another friend has coffee beans from the Dominican Republic that have grown as high as her ceiling, the plant with just enough beans to feel like home, alas, not enough to grow a cup of coffee. They are those graffiti marks, and you see them when you walk through our cities. What a beautiful backyard, isn't it? Most of us would say, what the heck is that? That to me is a thing of beauty. There's a fig tree in here that someone is protecting so carefully from all of the wildlife that we know so well. Squirrels and raccoons and anything else that can get their hands on it. It was first sacrificed in that little patch in the backyard for that fig tree. <coughs> Novelist Anthony de Saw writes about his childhood as a Portuguese immigrant. He wrote a book called Kicking the Sky. I love the book, Kicking the Sky. It's a beautiful book. And I talked to him about fig trees, because for 
him that unwrapping of the fig tree or bearing the fig tree was a symbol of that boy's coming of age. So I asked him about that newcomer idea of what is coming from, uh, from the trees. In those days, he said, the 60s and 70s, security at airports wasn't what it is today. Passengers descended the airplane steps onto the tarmac, and the family could watch from the airport windows. Anthony remembered the excitement of picking up an aunt or uncle who traveled to Portugal in the summer. He knew their bags would contain all sorts of interesting things. I still remember as a child, he said, getting into my grandmother's kitchen and having my uncle open up his bag and having live crabs come out of the bag. <laughs> And there was another bag of sausage and cheese, and then there was tucked in an area of the bag, there were paper towels that had been moistened and carefully layered with plastic and plastic bags, and in it were seeds and cuttings. <coughs> they were cuttings from grapevines, and the hope was that they could get them growing and plant them here. So much of what we see in the backyards and some of our neighborhoods came from those places. And did they take, I asked him, Anthony seemed as amazed today as he would have been then. Yes! So the hints that the things came from Portugal in, uh, from his family's tree are probably close to the truth. I think for them, he said, it had a lot of symbolic meaning about the place they came from, the place they left behind. And I think it was almost a link to that place to them, which I really think is almost more meaningful than the practical thing of getting fruit and feeding your family. So it also wasn't about the taste. It was the fact that we could do it. I was listening to an interview recently about how we've really moved away from the 50s and 60s in terms of how remarkable that time was in our world history. Because it was a time when people did things they just wanted to. They wanted to go to the moon. Why? Because we can. And that spirit is gone. And I think that's really exciting. That was part of it as well. It's not really about the fruit, Anthony said. It's about, let's see if we can. It was a challenge for these men. Anthony points out that there was no fear of weather where they came from. In Portugal, the fear was the power of the sea. Winter in the cold was an unknown foe to conquer. They took it on, adding to the Canadian literary theme of man against nature. I think that's the really magical part of something such a metaphor for what it is to survive in this country as an immigrant, Anthony said. It's to find ways to make things flourish in sometimes a very inhospitable kind of place, a foreign place, a strange place. Having that food makes it seem less strange. A paper produced through the Center for Studies in Food Security at Ryerson University shows how little that has changed over the years. Mustafa Pop and Jennifer Walsh found that feeling at home is not simply limited to having access to a nutritionally sufficient diet, but also to culturally appropriate foods. We learn and define who we are through what we eat, they wrote, the multicultural cuisine may offer a glimpse of widening notions of identity, self, and belonging in Canada. Who hasn't gone abroad for a while and craved Tim Hortons? Or a coffee crisp? Or ketchup, potato chips? Boy, our cuisine is great, isn't it? Research carried out with newcomers from Algeria, Zaire, Somalia, and Vietnam show freshness was a recurring theme, a longing for the tastier and fresher fruits and vegetables of their home country. We took sometimes postage stamp backyards as a result, just like this one, and cultivated them until they were producing enough produce to sustain a family through the winter. The urban farmers, so uncool at the time, so embarrassing to their children, aged. Their children left home, or they took over the house and added a deck along to the backyard that they grew. We made two car garages and added larger refrigerators. Eventually, big box stores with free parking. It became, we thought, cheaper, more convenient to drive for a bulk purchase than to pick an apple off of our own tree. There's no doubt that with fewer people at home with, and with two income households, the idea of sweating over a pot of preserves in the summer heat may seem too much to bear. 
Uh, and it's also true that a lot of the wives of these mostly men who were planting these figs and other plants, in fact, Francesco had a horde rigged up to his cherry tree that ran in through his kitchen window, and he would sit in the morning watching for those birds and ring the bell every time he saw them to scare them off. Where were the women? Changing diapers, working several part-time jobs, taking care of the children, and putting dinner on the table for when the men came home. Not at all men, let's be fair. That was certainly the case of Francesco, so says his son. Uh, so the women saw the practicality of going to law laws and buying that fruit. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, but in the process, there were these beautiful fruits growing outside. I want to talk a second now about this very neighborhood, about this part of the world, Dixie. Um, around 1950, careers in ice cutting disappeared. There's a clue. The long toothy saws are in museums now, and the movie Frozen, if you haven't seen it enough times yet. The number of cars in Canada went from roughly 1.5 million in 1945 to 2.6 million in 1950. You can move farther afield and find more property, new houses, and room for that garage or driveway. You can fill the tank with groceries for a week, no need for daily trips to the market. In many cases, orchards were bulldozed to make way for new subdivisions. In Mississauga, developers bought hundreds of acres of apple orchards and renamed part of the community of Dixie, Applewood. They took down the apple trees and named the community Applewood. They kept some of the trees intact, timing the 1951 gala opening for when the blossoms would be in full show. Because gosh, they're pretty, they didn't want the apples. Thomas Kennedy was Ontario's Prime Minister, as we referred to the Premier in those days. Uh, so he was the Prime Minister between 48 and 49. And he also happened to be a lifelong fruit grower from Dixie. He served as Minister of Agriculture in the 30s and 40s. In Dixie, Orchards to Industry, which I believe is a book prepared for the Mississauga Library, um, Kathleen Hicks writes that Kennedy was a huge supporter of farm life, but not one to mourn the good old days. I wouldn't want to go back to them, he said. They were too hard, and modern living is so comfortable. That's what he said in the 50s. Imagine today. So comfortable that we stopped needing to spray and prune and could enjoy the blossoms while eating our store-bought apples. Then we forgot what those blossoms would bring, and eventually, for many of us, whether the fruit growing in our own neighborhoods was safe to eat. That is the crux of the problem. So began our fruit illiteracy. We stopped processing food in the way we had before. We stopped turning to our babas and nonas and olas to show us how to prepare that fruit. Francesco said never did learn how to wrap that tree properly, neither did anybody in the shop. I want to show you another piece of that. What's this look like to you? Summer kitchen. Summer kitchen? It's hard to say. It's a greenhouse. This is in Lee's side, a decidedly Tony part of Toronto. Um, these panels up here are glass panes. I met someone who was the owner of this greenhouse and she took me on a tour. She said she had an orange tree. By orange tree, I thought she meant orange tree. The ones you buy around the uh, She has an orange tree. She has kept that greenhouse warm for 45 years. Before that, it belonged to someone else. The person who built that house, an Italian immigrant, had quickly put in radiator heating and kept it going outside to a space like this, glass. Kept the heating going so all the pipes continued outside. Dirt ground and put in an orange tree from Sicily and two fig trees. The orange tree grew so tall branches were elbowing out the panes of glass. So every couple of years they would have to go 
go and rotate and replace the glass. I asked her, this was Maya Sangster's name, the woman who owns it now, I asked her how much it has cost her over the years, to which she said, I don't even want to think about it. It's not the point, it's completely besides the point. I have this orange tree and there's no way I can let it die. She's taken that orange tree, and if you've ever eaten um, Seville oranges, you know that they are not very pleasant, but they make a beautiful marmalade. So this isn't even daily sustenance. They were growing. This was a treat, marmalade. She entered the marmalade competition at the Mad for Marmalade events in Toronto every year. Always wins, started giving them to other people, and then they would win until she was banned from giving people any more of her oranges because they were too good. By the way, lest you think it's a little niche thing, the event is sold out every year and it is shadowed only by the world marmalade competitions in Cumbria, England, which is finished and attracts competitors from around the world. So it's a thing. These oranges are a big deal, and they're still growing in a backyard. Yeah, she got um, something that, you know, like you could trade fruit or something so the windows go break. She has in the past. She's pruned she's pruned the figs. Um, she's now in her 80s, yes. and so she can't get up to do it. Her husband's ill, and they've lost the capacity to really take her. So now she's saying that <laughs> her kids are not interested in the house or the greenhouse, and she knows that once they go and sell them all, she said it would be a teardown. No one's going to take this on. It's possible the previous owners thought the same thing, so I like to think that that greenhouse is going to be there for another it would be beautiful, it would be lovely if someone wanted to go to volunteer. And she, you can see she's got a little bit of uh, fungus on, on these uh, oranges as well. It's been taken care of. It seems a shame. So, we lost seeing the potential. We lost seeing the food. And once we didn't know what it was, we started to question whether it was safe. Who hasn't questioned food growing on a tree, just in case, especially berries, let's put that out there. Don't try berries unless you know for sure. But there really are no bad apples, am I right? Apples are good, they're safe. Except for in um, fairy tales and Disney movies. <laughs> Even then, just watch out for that evil queen or witch or whatever she is. They've been tampered with. Generally speaking, apples are safe. Uh, chef and food activist Josh Lamarage puts it this way, this loss of literacy. This poisonous berry dismissal puts you oppositionally to your community. This notion that the life that grows is poisonous is a problem. It's evidence of our gross disconnection with nature and food. That's only half the story. I don't want you to think that the sky is falling, that all is lost. I am an optimist by nature, and this is, in my opinion, an optimistic quote. About 20 years ago, two guys in Victoria, B.C. looked at fruit dropping to the ground and said, Huh, that seems like a waste. We don't have any money. We're students. We're new graduates. We should pick it up. We should go around and harvest this stuff and see if we can put it to good use. So they did. They came up with what they thought at the time was a hair-brained idea. It was half-baked, to be sure. It took them a while to sort it out. They set up what was certainly the first urban harvest organization of its kind in Canada, and I believe it to be the first of its kind in North America. They did that from their rented front porch in Victoria, B.C. They went to a farmer's market Corkboard and a map of the city and some colored pins. And everyone who came by, they questioned as to whether they had a fruit tree in their yard. And they stuck a pin in the map until they found them all. And they went and they gathered some volunteers and they harvested them. They got it back and they had pounds and pounds of apples on their front porch. Now what genius, said me Heron. What do you do with this fruit that's now covered in wasps and getting ready to rot? So the second piece of that was figuring out what to do with it. So they found organizations that were in need of food. Food banks that have a hard time getting fresh food. Soup kitchens and the like. And they set up a formula. For everything they picked, one quarter
quarter would go to the volunteer pickers, a reward for picking. One quarter would go to the homeowner, thank you for letting us use your tree. One quarter would go to the organization that helped to monetize it in some way to keep the organization running. And one quarter would go to a community agency in me. That formula is what worked. Very soon, there was a similar organization in Vancouver. More organizations on Vancouver Island. They moved across, across the country, and today we have about 13 organizations of the time across the country. So there's one in Edmonton, Calgary, Sudbury, not places we usually think of as a fruit belt. Toronto. There was one in Mississauga for a while. It's um, been suspended, I understand. It'd be great if it came back if anyone is so inclined. Uh, it did well while, it's, while it was here. Alas, it's gone. We have to say, why didn't I think of that, right? So here's a guy. This is Anthony DeSauce's uncle. You know what he's standing beside here? Great time. Great time, yeah. Yeah, look at the size of it. That's a 45-year-old grapevine. And so he uh, passed away not long ago. Again, it is my hope, and I'm not going to go see, because I don't want to see if it's gone. My hope that that grapevine is still there, and some of them can eat from it. I just love the way he's, his arm around, is around that tree as if it's his girlfriend. I like that. He has nurtured that vine for so many years, and who knows how many glasses of wine, juice, table grapes he's had from it. And so we look at this today. Uh, backyards full of grapevines that are no longer wanted by the new people who move in. They call up an organization like Not Far From A Tree. We go in and pick them. Can we make something with it? We're thrilled to have it. Four people standing in this tiny little backyard, surrounded by the grapes, like we're in a church with stained glass windows, taking in the scent and having conversations. What are you going to do with the grapes? I'm going to, I'm going to squeeze them and make juice. I'm making a pie with it. Great pie. I didn't know it was a thing. I learned that in the tree. I made a jam. Yep. Actually, uh, the grapes in my backyard are uh, all eight by birth. Yep. All of them? Yeah, all of them. Wow. Okay, you got to be faster. <laughs> yeah, in my backyard is the raccoon. They take everything first. There's something left for the squirrels, the birds are the last to get in there. But sometimes they're all in there at the same time. Yeah. But they're so great. And so we make something. Again, my own version of a stained glass window in my house is somehow that something preserves up on the window so This one happens to be a great cranberry preserve. Looking for something to go with your turkey, I highly recommend it. Um, so we say to ourselves, yeah, why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we think to go and pick these fruits? It seems so simple. <coughs> they had a few details to sort out, like insurance. They needed insurance because you can't just walk into someone's backyard and have them say, sure, climb my tree, knowing that they're probably liable for it. Uh, and then they had to find the agencies and come up with a model. Here we are, the Mississauga Fruit Tree, it was called Mississauga Fruit Tree. Website's still there. Uh, one of their blog posts tells us that apples from Malta alone uh, garnered them more than 2,000 pounds of fruit in 2011. So just in the fall, just from apples, they got 2,000 pounds of fruit. Imagine that, free fruit, 2,000 pounds. You think of what you pay for a bag of apples. Now as impressive as that is, in Toronto, not far from the tree, is celebrating its 10th year of operations. Last year it collected more than 12,000 pounds of fruit. And if that sounds like a lot, imagine this. The organization estimates that 1.5 million pounds of fruit are produced in the city each year. So what we're collecting is a tip of the iceberg, but it takes resources to do that. Not far from the tree uses a zero carbon, foot, carbon footprint model. So everything is moved on bicycles. So you will see what they refer to as their supreme cleaners, which is the best title every any 
anywhere. I would love to have that on my resume, but I'm not going to peddle tricycle with 200 pounds of fruit in the basket up front to get that title. <laughs> so they do that. They pedal this bike down city streets with all this fruit in it until they get to an agency and need the fruit. It's a beautiful thing to see. There are other places where they do use cars elsewhere. Um, not far from the tree is thinking about expanding to other parts of the city, farther afield where a bike just isn't practical, and then they will have to give and allow some kind of car sharing to go on to move that fruit. But that's not the only reason for optimism. We see more people interested in the provenance of their food today. The 100 mile diet changed our view of what's fresh and how we can control our carbon footprint. Farmers markets are no longer reserved for visits to Elmira or Kensington. And I think we're all becoming more mindful about how food grows. Is it organic? Is it modified somehow? You can be sure that an apple grown in the backyard that's a little bit wormy hasn't been sprayed with anything. And the worms, furthermore, if you can stomach it, grew up in that apple, so they probably haven't been infected with anything either. But Sandy's going to help us with that. I'm out on a limb here. A limb, right? As the backyard fruit trees age, even if they aren't replaced in as robust ways as they had been, we're also seeing a renewed interest in urban orchards. These are our fruit pickers coming out and uh, having these conversations in the tree picking fruit. It's one of the fruit picking baskets that are not far from the tree uses as do fruit farmers to pick fruit fruits and cherries. And we find those fruits in the most unlikely places. So this is a very typical urban setting. Two houses, cheek by jowl, this tiny little alley alleyway to peek through. We uh, parked our bikes and shinnied our way back to discover this. Massive, massive, untamed, unpruned to the point. Cherry tree that was so laden with fruit, it was unbelievable. And the cherries were absolutely delicious. The owner didn't want them. The tenants didn't like them. Can you imagine? So we left this gorgeous haul of cherries that we just ate out of our hands. There was no need to cook them. They were gone. I took them home and they were gone within days. Apples galore. Apples again. At a time when fences are plentiful and what's mine is mine, some of us are beginning to share not only the bounty, but the responsibility for growing it. There are bumps, of course. Not everyone likes the idea of an urban orchard. In Victoria, Dartmouth, and Toronto, new urban orchards have been set up where they haven't had them before. Susan Poisner is one of the organizers behind the Ben Nobleman Community Orchard in Toronto, right outside of a subway station. And she was surprised by the initial response. She had this idea that people would really love this, that they take this old park that was kind of run down, and they would put it in an orchard, and people would enjoy it. The city councillor had heard some rumblings, because of course there were permits involved. He called the community meeting. It didn't go well. We had the meeting, said Susan. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of concerns. It wasn't pretty. It was kind of horrible. Susan was still shaking her head at the memory. Other concerns that came out of the meeting were, for instance, my children will get cherry stains on their t-shirts. Well, Another objector, Susan told me, believed that rapes and murders would increase. Because, you know, rapists could hide behind trees or something like that. <laughs> Yet another was worried about more roadkill because raccoons would be attracted to the fruit and then get run over on the street. She also heard worries about bees and mess and maintenance, reasonable issues to raise, she remembered, that could be addressed with a strong and committed stewardship program. Usually, these orchards are not allowed unless there is a strong stewardship component to it. So, a strong community organization that has been there for years and will continue to be there. In the case of Dartmouth, it had to do with uh, community 
community garden that was already set up and had been there for about 25 years. And they knew they could count on it. They'd seen it renewed over the years. The people of retired would let them come in, so they would take care of those trees. Malcolm Bromley is Vancouver's general manager of Parks and Recreation, and he heard similar talk. Concerns about new urban orchards who know no boundaries. Even in Vancouver, for crying out loud. I met Malcolm at a National Park Summit. His assessment is that a lot of the worries about mess come from a fixation on neatness. If you look at British parks and British gardens, they tend to be very ornamental and very perfect, kind of how they're laid out. We aren't meant to engage with what lies beyond the fencing. These are gardens for admiring only. Picture Kew Gardens in London or the Tuileries Garden in Paris. Parts of Dartmouth Common will fit into that picture. Park space in the common has included pruned gardens and mown grass. That European model has seeped into parks maintenance standards. Trees that draw fruit pose a conflict to the manicured approach, not just for park users, but for the people who maintain them. Speed, cleanliness, and mowing are the keys. And if there are apples there, what do we do with them? Malcolm goes to the nut of the issue. It's helping the parks people understand that the benefits far outweigh the risks. And more and more, people like Malcolm are encouraging their own cities to change their plans and say, it's okay to grow fruit in the city again. Let's do that. Where was I here? There we go. Um, the funny thing happens when you're picking fruit, whether it's in a community orchard, or strangers' backyard, you have conversations. You put down your cell phone. You look at things like this and you say, who worked up that tree? Apparently, it was a thing back in the day. This is a tree from the old Studley farm in Halifax on the, uh, just on the edge of the campus of uh, the University of King's College, just on the edge of Dalhousie. Some of the apple trees are left over, and the trees got hollow. They used to break them up, thinking that would help them stand longer. It did help them stand longer, but it also trapped moisture, so the trees didn't last as long. However, this one, as old as it is, as bricked up as it is, still produces fruit. And on a campus, like many campuses in Canada, where there are food banks, students walk past and don't see the apples. They're not the prettiest, but they would make a fine applesauce. You have conversations about that. You have conversations about what's going to be done with the fruit. I had a conversation with someone who was from a mental health organization who said they have set up a SWAT team at their kitchen, their community kitchen, so that when a load of fruit comes in, because you never know when it'll come, they have people at the ready, armed with peelers and mashers and aprons, ready to take on this fruit and turn it into something that their guests would enjoy. You have to plan for them. You talk about recipes and which organization will receive the fruit. You learn how far people will travel for free fruit or just for the privilege of being able to climb a tree. It feels good to climb a tree. And you learn about trees and fruit and how the garden grows. You become part of the community. This is an old apple tree on the grounds of Hunger College in Totoro. These apple trees were planted and maintained by uh, patients that was the, that what was then called the uh, Mimical Insane Asylum. It was taken over by Hunger College and now houses classrooms. The apple trees are still there. Look at this, it's so wild. It's still fruiting, although nobody touches it. As you can see, it's not fruit. It produces fruit. Look at this beauty. Who wouldn't want to taste that? Uh, we are very hopeful that this whole movement will come together and take on that orchard, which is getting smaller as new buildings go in, so that we can start putting cider festivals on campus collect those apples and put them into the cafeteria, as Ryerson has. Ryerson University has 50 service berry trees dotted around the campus. Really good trees for um, the urban environment, I understand. Apparently, who 
grow them everywhere except for in my backyard. I've killed two, but I haven't given up yet. Uh, and Ryerson, Joshua Maharaj, who I mentioned, was brought in to change the food at Ryerson to make it better, to make it more local, to make it more nutritious. One of the things they do is they harvest those 50 surface berry trees and they cook them and put them into dishes that are served on campus. So the students not only see the trees grow, they can pick them from the tree and have a snack, and then they'll see them on their plates at dinner time. This is Susan Poister's orchard, Ben Noble Orchard. It doesn't look too scary, does it? This kid doesn't look like she's too worried about any terrorist thing. And I point out here, this is the subway station. This is how close it is. Uh, right at the tip of the Allen Expressway, the most unlikely place for an orchard. But there it is, and this concept of community is building already. Teachers are bringing their classrooms here to explain to students where their food comes from. They don't have to go on a bus trip out to a pick your own. Now they can just walk down the block and see that food is a possibility in your own community. So Pardon me? I'm not sure what the solar panels in the back. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're related to. I think it's a subway. Yeah. And you start to see things like this. You start to see the brick wall views that a lot of us see in our urban environments and that Beautiful plums are growing there, and you will look up, and you'll reach up, and you'll take a plum. You'll see the blossoms, and you'll know to come back in a couple of months when the fruit is in full form. You'll see king pokes. Correction, you'll smell king pokes. If anyone has smelled a king pok, you know. You probably have smelled it, you don't know. It smells like a combination of Name it. Diapers and vomit? Garlic? Pardon me? Garlic? Garlic? No. <laughs> Nothing as nice as that. <laughs> like durian. Like durian, yeah. Like durian, yeah. The stink is so awful. Although the trees are beautiful. But when you see this fruit, when you smell that, you will look up and see this fruit and know that if you scrape off all the fruit, inside is a nut that you can roast and in many parts of the world it's considered a delicacy. Don't eat the fruit, it's poisonous. The nut itself, <laughs> when roasted, is quite tasty, like a chestnut. Ginkgo. G-I-N-K-G-O. K-O. Uh, you will notice, as you take public transit, that we plant trees along our transit ways, too. Oops, I'm to stop leaning on this. This is um, a subway station, the Bathurst subway station. That's a streetcar in the back, which is why that part's in focus and not berries. These are service berries. I went back three times to those plants to get uh, yogurts, full yogurt-sized containers full of fruit. Nobody's picking them. And you can. It's okay. And eventually, <laughs> you will get in your car and you will see this. And before you turn on the windshield wipers to get rid of that purple bird coat, choke cherries. It could be choke cherries. But the key is you will see that and you will look up and you will say, the mulberries are in season. Gotta get my ladder. It does. And so I hope that you see that. I hope that this book and what we've talked about will make you look up from that tie-dye stained sidewalk and think of the possibility. Look at what's above and what's growing in our cities. Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome. Sorry, I I, uh, I was happy to say a few words.
don't have anything long to say. I'm here to sort of echo some of the uh, the words of Helena. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to, you know, I guess speak as a scientist. I work in this field all the time in terms of trees. Not necessarily fruit trees, but I see fruit trees as just another type of a tree. And um, myself and my, my research students that are, have been, I've been working on them for oh, 25, 30 years. And, and I teach urban forest conservation. I even teach engineers green urban infrastructure to start talking about uh, nature in, in our urban environments. And uh, I, I always start the lecture with a couple of things. But one of them is I'm talking about the living green. I'm not talking about solar panels or windmills. I'm talking about the stuff here. And, and the fruit piece is, uh, the animal piece is really important for humans. But there's so many values to that. Um, there's biodiversity. I'm happy when you tell me the birds eat it and the insects eat it because it makes our urbanized world a lot more livable. We call it biodiversity. We talk about ecosystem or eco ecological services. It's, it's all important and we, it's not only ever in the bush. When I was uh, at Dean of the Faculty of Forestry, people would always say, uh, often would say, oh, forestry in downtown Toronto, why is that? Why don't you go where the trees are? And I would sit there, and I know kind of what they're talking about, Group of Seven, there was some vision they had of Algonquin and Banff. But I said, look around you, we're surrounded by trees, but you don't really see them. And I, I guess I would echo what your, your book's trying to speak to. I haven't read it yet, and I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, I think we don't look around, and I think it's time to really start looking around and then to see nature that's there. It's so very important for all these other issues. Engineers, I talk about the cooling values of trees, whether they're fruit trees or just general trees. They intercept rain, they slow this rapid downpouring that concrete has created. Mississauga's been really innovative in that they have a tax base on hard surface. So your property taxes are based on how much is an impermeable surface uh, because you need soft surfaces to grow fruit, to grow trees, and, and other natural uh, values that come from that. So Mississauga, I'd love to see Toronto do that. It would be an even longer political fight than many of the other ones. But, but it speaks to what's valuable and what's important for communities as we all of us live more and more in cities. The other thing I usually ask my, uh, when I do my first lecture with my engineers is sort of, because it's for me to get a sense of what people think about, especially these 20 year olds somewhere, where, wherever they come from. And they come from all over the world, it's really great. And I'm going to do that experiment, I figure I was going to do it here. Is how many people have a tree in their front yard? Okay, how many people don't know they have, whether they have a tree in their front yard? Okay, that's good, that's good. How many people know what kind of tree it is? Okay, they can give it a name. Um, how many people uh, know whether it's healthy or not? See, I, I usually get a few, and then yeah. How many people know whether it has fruit on it or not? That's a I don't usually ask that, but this makes sense. How many know whether it's an edible tree? <laughs> okay, so I, I often, it's, it's typical. I usually see more people put their hands up, although, with the engineering group that I help, hopefully there's no engineers that are here. Um, usually they're, you can see the puzzle blank, they can't remember whether they actually have a tree in their front yard. Partly because they're students and they're probably renting and they haven't really thought about it. Um, sometimes they're not sure if the hydro pole was actually a tree, they just didn't, you know, look up. <laughs> and your apple, <laughs> yeah, your, your apple story reminded me very much of, you know, when I arrive three apples on the ground, wherever I am, I pick them up and look at them and usually eat them. Uh, but you're right, I, most, I see most people walk by and just, they don't even see them, which amazes me. I grew up in the country, so I just kind of, that, that's something what I would naturally do. Um, just a, a few more words, I guess. I was going to say, there's a, I don't know if you've read Doug Talmy's book, he's a, a colleague of mine in uh, University in, in Maryland, and he, he has done a lot of work, work cultural work. Um, fruit trees, again, are, are a piece of that because of the blossoms and the pollen and, and the bees. He's an entomologist like myself at heart, so interested in what else lives in, in um, trees that are, are found in cities. And he has uh, some really excellent, um, he's got a recent publication um, in from backyard, so related to backyard trees. And his focus is native trees. So I guess I would add, and I'm not a geeko fan, I'll, I'll acknowledge that right now. <laughs> I'm not a geeko fan, uh, because 
think there's not even long on this continent, let alone in, in the city. But that's open for discussion, and I'm really here to answer any questions people have on the science. But he's very much about native biodiversity, if you want to keep our native birds, our native insects, our communities that are here. Um, we need to help support those because we fairly quickly lose them. I think we've always had food, uh, and most of our food, as you said earlier, come from somewhere else. People forget, Canada sees itself as uh, what, cattle and wheat, sort of, you know, from the prairies. Neither of those come from here. Um, so, as great as we are in terms of that agriculture, we've set it up as something that works for us for various reasons. Um, so, I guess I would emphasize the, the native biodiversity. At the fact that I'm working a lot now with the ravine systems and speaking about native diversity, we're looking at old growth trees, maintaining these really old growth trees. I don't know as the bricks and the concrete really help them to live a lot longer. Trees are meant to get hollow as they get older. You think of an eggshell, it's pretty strong. The structure and the, the engineering dynamics of a tree, it actually is it, it resilient. It's, it can live a thousand years and still be hollow. So it's about depth of, of hollows. It's a ratio, so I won't go into the, the math of that, but um, I think we worry too much about restoration, even now, when I'm working with Rosedale and, and some of the communities in the ravines, which I do a lot of work, they, they want to restore, they want to put it back. And um, I think there's this real need to reconnect with nature and understand what was there. And it brings a lot more knowledge to an awareness of our world. So a little survey on you, have a tree in the front yard, I think is important. Books like this, I think, just help to raise that profile. You see in cities like Seattle and Portland, I'm in urban forestry, I think it's called the oxymoron. Marshall McLuhan loved that term uh, when he was at the university, when he first created that term in the 60s. He said, that's really great, you know, urban and forestry. Like, it's just wrong. So the fact that it's wrong means that we're going to think a lot more about it and, and try and imagine what that is, and I think we're creating it. And I think the food, food forest, food trees, and thinking about that is a really key part of it. So, that's all I really wanted to say. I'm excited to see another new book that supports uh, forests and nature and stewardship. So. Yeah. You can ask me, or you can like if you see yellowing, if you see dieback, if you see parts of the tree failing, um, usually you see wilting. I always tell students that um, look at what a, a, a normal tree should look like, and if yours doesn't look like that, of that species that there's probably something going on with it. And I would say again, as an entomologist, I always get called in, what's wrong with my tree? That's always one of the first questions when they know what I do. And um, what I usually, you know, I say nine times out of 10, it's not the thing above ground, there's something going on below ground, there's been some change, somebody's made a pig, put in an extra parking pad, has changed the drainage, you see a lot of roadside salts. So in cities, there's a lot of, just from what humans want to do with that space. And, and yeah, we start to lose it. You know, I didn't talk really about the old growth, but there's old, that old grapevine. Um, there's, has anyone seen in the news that like Edith George is fighting for a tree? Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and Memo Levy might support her. I, I'm so amazed. Yeah. <laughs>
Like, we're coming up to the Cherry Tree Festival in Hyde Park. Mm. Are any of those cherry trees edible? Nope. They're all bred for the uh, ornament, right? They are, and there's, I mean, there's a value in the beauty, too. Yeah. But I can't help when I look at those trees, wondering how much food they could produce. Is the blossoms without the fruit that they're, they're bred to do that? Well, wouldn't that be marvelous to have the Cherry Festival in Hyde Park? Um, or the Cherry Festival. Picking Festival. It, yeah, Cherry Picking Festival, not just Cherry Blossoms. Which they do in, in Portugal, by the way. It could be all year round instead of just the three week window. Right. Blossoms, it could be all year round. Yeah. 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 And related to that is, there's a tree that lives next door to us that I hate. <laughs> I hated it since it was planted. It's a Russian olive tree. And it was planted because it was fast growing. And that fruit is not edible. The tree is just messy all year round. And why are we, why, I can't understand how we can't get people to plant native trees instead of trees like that. It's probably an insoluble question, yeah, I think but I really hate that tree. It comes back to what we were saying earlier, we like it neat, uh, we like things well manicured, maintained, we have this sort of vision, and I think that's the Anglo-Saxon or British sort of mindset. And we talked earlier about the study that was done, and our faculty, my predecessor, had a student who was on that committee, and they looked at our neighborhood downtown, and I think it was, was it Italian, uh, Asian, and Anglo-Saxon? Mediterranean, sorry, yes, it was not a thing, it was a Portuguese Italian, predominantly in that community, and I asked them about trees, and it was so clear that the Anglo-Saxons love trees, the bigger the better, the more it blocked the house, and, you know, gave them security and shade, um, the Mediterranean, it was okay if they had fruit, like that, there was no point to a tree unless it actually was part of the system. And I think it was the Asian community, they weren't used to that tree, in fact, it could be bad luck sometimes. And so they, they really had some difficulty with uh, having trees at all because they came from a culture that just didn't. So I think people transplant things and they have this mindset of which trees. That's what I think. Sorry. And there's an interesting thing that there's, if you go into cemeteries where, the type of cemetery where the um, loved ones get to decide what tree is planted, it's interesting to see what's there because there are a lot of fruit trees in cemeteries. <laughs> now, does that mean that someone always loved that crab apple blossoming in the spring, but they really didn't think about the fruit and they don't care because it's in the cemetery, it's not in my backyard, I don't know. But there is a ginkgo, and I did several ginkgos planted in one of the big cemeteries I've gone through, that fruit. So maybe they love the ginkgo tree and accidentally planted the wrong one. I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting that that would be a last wish that I want on a ginkgo tree planted at my gravesite. And people go and harvest it. One of my many questions. Um, I, one of the, I, I live in St. Paris, which we almost all want to know where Francesca is. Um, can't say. <laughs> no. Um, I uh, have one of those big grapevines in that, and we have tried and can't stand the fruit. Uh, we love the ornamental aspect of it, but every year we pick the fruit. And I don't really need to have anybody else pick it for me, but I'd love to be able to give it to someone. Is there any way of doing that short of putting bags out where friends do? Which is, so I'm not far from the tree, it comes out and picks it for you. But if I pick it, they'll take it. They'll take it. No, they want to pick it. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. And they'll, they'll get the job done in two hours. Oh, that's right. yeah. yeah. So I should just have them over there. You can have them pick it, or you can go to one of the agencies that they drop off fruit to, and they're happy to have it. Um, in that area, the Nominee Grass takes a lot of not far from the tree's fruit and its residents. Yep. Another one that participates farther down, but um, Evangel Hall, okay. takes fruit. They participate in a program called Grow a Row, Give a Row. And so if you have a garden in your backyard, when you're planting vegetables even, make sure you put in an extra row that you're going to donate, and they'll take it, because they serve food all the time. That's great. There are lots of places that will take it. Sharing Place you know, on the next street will take fruit. But I don't want to do the work for me. I really should just stop. <laughs> 
You say you don't like it, but have you juiced it? Yes. <laughs> have you put sugar in it? Yeah, it's phosphorus. Our neighbors, it's actually in our neighbor's yard, and we gave them back to them one year, and they said no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs>